Okay, guys. Um, welcome. Uh, just uh, welcome to another session of Zoom, uh, MENG 210 uh, or 260. I'm sorry, 210 is the statics. My mind is going to statics. So um, just one second, okay? I think if someone is knocking on the door, so just one second, okay? Just give me one second. So, so now, now I'm back. All right, great. Sorry about that. Um, today is June 17, okay, Wednesday, and I uh, hope everybody is doing well. So let's, uh, let's see if you have any questions, guys. Do you have any questions about the exam? I'm still grading your second midterm. I have graded about 20, I think, exams so far out of 36 or 37. Um, it's tedious work. I have to go through them one by one, uh, step by step. And uh, if the handwriting is clear, then it's easier. But if the handwriting is not clear, I have to zoom it so that I can see it. All right, so far so good. You know, everybody has done really well. And um, let's see, I will, hopefully I will finish grading by today and I will post it by tonight sometimes, okay? All right, so, and then I have to grade chapter five. I have to, I've graded it, but I need to post the chapter or homework number five, okay? Homework number five. And then I have to grade homework number six is not due. Uh, someone has already submitted homework number six, uh, one a student, but, it's not due until tomorrow, okay? It's not due. Okay, we talked about the uh, fluid uh, flow and we talked about the internal flow. And then we talked about the Reynolds number, laminar flow, transitional period or, or flow, and turbulent flow. So we, we have discussed the internal flow. And now I said, let me just cover a little bit of the external flow in case, so you have some ideas of what external flow looks like. And uh, that will be a, a, a knowledge to have because down the road, if you're taking more classes in this area, so you have at least some background, okay, some background. Again, what I'm going to discuss today is a boundary layer theory. And whenever we're dealing with a flow, what is air, whether it's air or water or any other liquid, uh, we need to, um, over a flat plate or flat plate surface, we need to talk about the boundary layer thickness. And in a higher level, you know, upper division courses, um, there is a course uh, that is known as boundary layer course. So that course, it goes into details of fluid flow uh, uh, on a surface and a boundary layer that is going to develop and how thick, how thick the boundary layer is going to be. It depends on the, the velocity profile and upstream velocity and the viscosity, okay, and the viscosity of the fluid. So the larger the, visc the, the, larger the viscosity, the lar larger the thickness, the, I call it the boundary layer thickness. So um, let me see if I can start on my note because I prepared the note. Again, I almost went to a PowerPoint. And I said I really don't want it to work with a PowerPoint because there is so much they're talking about, unbelievable. I said I'm gonna summarize it for you guys, okay? All right, so. And this is a, an example of external flow. Let me just uh, double click on here. Let me know if it's not clear, okay? If it's not clear. All right, so external flow. It, it's a common practice in fluid, you know, if somebody is majoring in aerospace, aeronautical engineering, uh, you are going to um, uh, test different shapes, different geometric shapes and trying to uh, understand the drag coefficient and the lift coefficient. If we have an aircraft wing, we're testing on a wind tunnel, or, or we have a, some bodies, okay? Maybe a rectangular shape or a spherical shape, uh, triangular shape, and so on. Because back in the old time, 
I used, you know, I was working with a professor that we, uh, my job was to test all these geometric shapes and come up with a drag coefficient. This is, I'm talking about 40 some years ago, okay? And uh, every time I see this topic here, it reminds me of when I was just, I know, uh, very young. So I'm still young, but again, uh, you know, age, that's the way it is. We cannot really stop it, we cannot control it. Uh, so if we have an airfoil like this and we wanted to test this uh, in a wind tunnel, the air the, uh, goes, you know, in this direction here, but this U at this point, we call it the upstream velocity. And then we have an L, which is a left, and then we have a drag, okay? Left, drag, and upstream velocity. And then we have a lower, lower case U, which we call it a velocity profile, which is a function of X and Y, okay? X and Y, if we're gonna talk about that when we have a flat plate. So for airfoil, um, this is the this is the typical of laboratory work in the in a, in a aerospace engineering students that are uh, uh, planning to get a degree in that field. So they use this kind of shape to for testing. So, and then the C subscript L means left coefficient. C subscript D means drag coefficient. We have already talked about the drag coefficient in one of the chapters at the earlier chapters, I believe. So the CL is equal to the lowercase l divided by one half rho and instead of V squared, which is a dynamic head from Bernoulli equation, times area, okay, times area. So one half and instead of V, we call it U, okay, one half rho U squared. In this, uh, you know, topic that in external flow, they represent the upstream velocity by capital letter U. And if the, the question is to determine the co drag coefficient, then the numerator is a lowercase d, so that's a drag d. And this is cd is a drag coefficient, one half rho u squared times area. Okay, all right, so that is just the, to the foundation, okay, foundation. External flow, the various aspects of the flow over bodies that are in, immersed in a fluid. Example, flow of air around airplanes, cars, or bicycles, any bodies that are subjected to air that is coming toward it, perpendicular to that plane, and then the, the flow is going to touch that surface. So we're going to analyze that in terms of boundary layer. Okay? Flow of water around the boats, submarines, and fish, or what, or what have you. All right, so boundary layers on a flat plate, we're going to analyze, okay? Boundary layer on a flat plate. And uh, if we uh, move this a little bit uh, down here, okay? So let me see if I can move it to the left a little bit so I can push this paper forward. Okay, so if we have a, an arbitrary flat plate, and then we have a leading edge here. This is the x-axis, this is the y-axis. And this is subjected to a fluid flow, say air is flowing in this direction. And that's it. We call this a velocity profile. And this is called the uniform upstream velocity that you okay. And then the profile looks like this, okay? But the distance from leading edge to some distance here, we call it the laminar flow. It's controlled by a Reynolds number. Reynolds number. And then we have a, a, a portion of this flow that is going to uh, switch from laminar to turbulent. So there is a period that we call it a transitional uh, region. So the transitional region, and then it goes to turbulent and that continues. All right. Um, all right. So far, so good. Uh, let me move this a little bit further. Okay. So uh, at that point, at the lead, leading edge, we have x equals zero, y equals zero, and the lowercase u is zero, which is the uh, profile, you know, like that here, u is zero. And then delta as a function of x, we call it the boundary layer thickness, okay? Boundary layer thickness is denoted by delta as a function of x which for laminar flow has been proven to be five times the square root of uh, kinematic viscosity times X uh, divided by um, 
upstream velocity. So that is the formula that is used to calculate the uh, uh, boundary layer thickness uh, in, uh, uh, when this, the, 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 we're dealing with a flow over a flat plate, okay, flat plate. And the CD, you know that the CD for laminar flow, the coefficient, uh, drag coefficient equals the lowercase d, one half rho u square. If we have a plate that has a dimension of d times l, and then we have, uh, we can just simplify this based on experimental data, 1.328 divided by Reynolds number as a function of length, okay? So the Reynolds number as a function of length is given as such. So if we have, a, it depends on how the orientation of the flat plate is, that's a length of the B, which is a thickness, based on the flat plate's length, the Reynolds number is calculated as upstream velocity times the length divided by kinematic viscosity. So that's a typical, uh, and then we have a Reynolds number for laminar flow. We know that based on the condition of, um, uh, that we have gone over last time, so, and then we have a, uh, a profile that, let me see if I can move this to the side here. So if I move this here, this is the typical profile, we call it boundary layer thickness as a function of X. And that profile is, um, you can first start from the leading edge and it has a, like a parabolic shape. And the distance to the point, say we have Y delta equals Y, at that level here, okay, approximately. And then we have a, um, the profile, the velocity profile, is going to be 99% of the upstream velocity, okay, 99%. It's just some percentage that characteristics of the flow, they just use 99% of upstream, okay. So delta, boundary layer thickness, a function of x at y equals delta, this uh, specific velocity, or I call it velocity profile, as a function of x and y, we call this lowercase u velocity profile, capital letter U, we call it the upstream velocity, okay? So this is in a nutshell, this is really a summarized of a textbook that you can have a book of, that explains uh, the, the complexity of a boundary layer Theory, okay. Somebody wants to major in thermal sciences and that you have to take analytical thermodynamics, advanced fluid mechanics, heat transfer, and then gas dynamics, rotor dynamics, and all kinds of courses that in higher level, uh, graduate level courses, then you have to take one upper division classes called boundary layer theory. Uh, so uh, this is just a summarize of that. And if I look at one example uh, of uh, fluid flows, a fluid flow state, state, state away, has a flat plate with a velocity, upstream velocity of 10 feet per second, at approximately what location will the boundary layer become turbulent? Because we start with the assumption that we start with a laminar, and then the upstream velocity is 10 feet per second, at approximately what location, at approximately what location, will the boundary layers become turbulent, and how thick is the boundary layer at that point if the fluid is considered to be water at 60 degree Fahrenheit, air at the standard condition, or glycerin, okay, or glycerin, another uh, fluid. So, uh, in order to determine the, uh, the boundary layer thickness, we're gonna just make some assumptions, and that assumption is this, the boundary layer flow is laminar up to transition, up to the transitional uh, point. The uh, transition to uh, turbulent flow occur at a critical Reynolds number, REXC, which we call it a critical Reynolds number, around five times 10 to the fifth, which is a dimensionless, um, value, okay, Reynolds number critical. So C is for critical. Reynolds number as a function of X for a flat plate over a flat plate at a critical juncture, we call it, a, uh, that value is five times 10 to the five. So critical Reynolds number, so. And then the boundary layer thickness as is critical at the critical point where the flow is going to change from laminar to turbulent 
and that is a critical Reynolds number or critical and uh, the boundary layer thickness at that critical juncture, we call that five times, okay, five times the square root of uh, kinematic viscosity times X divided the upper, um, uh, upper boundary or upper uh, stream velocity, okay, uh, capital letter U. So uh, the critical from here, uh, let me see the critical uh, X is going to be calculated by this formula. This is equation number one, this is equation number two. So the XC is kinematic viscosity times the Reynolds number uh, at the critical juncture. Okay, so maybe I should do that. And then we have the upstream velocity divided by that. So this is given to us, the Reynolds number at the, you know, the critical uh, uh, region. We have five times 10 to the five divided by upstream velocity, which is given to us uh, 10 feet per second. So uh, from here, we can come up with X, the critical distance where the, um, and the flow is going to you know, turn from laminar to turbulent. That juncture, we call it the X critical, that distance. So that distance is five times 10 to the four times the kinematic viscosity. So we have the X as a function of viscosity now. And if we substitute, if we substitute equation number one into equation number, uh, number, let me see, we wanted to solve for delta. Okay, yeah. If we substitute equation number two into equation number one, we're gonna end up with, this is the um, boundary layer thickness here and five times the factor is five, and then we substitute for X, uh, five times 10 to the four kinematic viscosity, and we have the kinematic uh, viscosity over 10, which is that part here. So this is a substitution. And if you do a little bit of mathematical uh, manipulation or use the ma cal your calculators, you end up with this value, which is uh, three, uh, 354 second per feet, times the kinematic viscosity, because the kinematic viscosity is a, a feet square over second. So if the second and second cancel each other out, feet is square with feet will cancel each other out, so you have a feet left. So therefore, the boundary layer thickness has a unit of length, okay? That makes sense? All right, so then we have to go to a table and uh, uh, determine or, or look up the kinematic viscosity for water. Like in the, in the textbook, we have FM-1. That's a table that you can look up the kinematic viscosity, uh, just the viscosity, dynamic viscosity, which is new. Uh, it's tabulated, okay? It's a tabulated in a table in appendices in any textbook, thermosciences textbook. So if we are dealing with water as uh, liquid, and the kinematic viscosity is 1.2, one times 10 to the negative five feet square, feet square per second. And then the critical length is 0.6. It occurs at the critical length of 0 0.0.605. And then if you substitute that into here, okay, you can find the uh, boundary layer thickness of 0.00. .00 Four to eight. So when you have your equation ready, and if they give you that fluid, and you can substitute the, and they, they, they give you the kinematic viscosity of that fluid, you can determine the boundary layer thickness. So that's what we have in here for air. It's this value for kinematic viscosity, and 7.85 is a critical feet distance or critical, you know, value uh, where the flow is start from the leading edge to some distance that becomes a laminar, okay, but here we can say that this is the laminar region. So say we have some critical distance XC, okay, all right, so. And then we go down to uh, the, and then the boundary layer thickness for air is larger than the boundary layer thickness for, for water. So um, that is a good comparison here because this is much, uh, uh, in terms of fluid, you know, it's just not as dense as, you know, it's a fluid flow that is going to just uh, go over the surface, um, but the air is might be thicker than the boundary layer thickness of that 
the, the air is increases as the kinematic viscosity of the air increases. So then if you, if you just uh, pick another fluid called glycerine, and it has a, a kinematic viscosity, which is larger than the air and water, and then the critical, it happened at the critical juncture or distance of 640 feet, and then therefore the boundary layer thickness is much, much higher than the other two fluids. So this is nice, you know, just that I wanted to share this with you or review this with you in case one day you are doing research or you have been exposed to some environment of uh, external flow or uh, you wanted to go to graduate school, maybe you're going to major in thermal sciences. You never know. It is good to have some foundation, some base uh, before you take off and you go to the next level. So you never know in your life suddenly you switch and from industrial or from mechanical, from electrical field to different field. So it's good to have diverse knowledge, okay? Diverse knowledge is, is great. That means power is, knowledge is power, okay? So if the, viscous, if, if the viscosity increase, is increased, laminar flow can be maintained uh, on a, if the viscosity is increased, laminar flow can be maintained on a longer portion of the plate. Therefore, the boundary layer thickness is larger if the viscosity is increased, okay? So that's what I wanted to really share that with you. And uh, I think I gave you homework on this area. I don't remember, but um, again, it's, if, uh, if you have a homework problem, this will be a nice thing to, to, to review. And this is the end of chapter 14, okay? Great. So I'm done with chapter 14. And now I wanted to uh, have a transition from uh, boundary layer theory to heat transfer, okay? Heat transfer. We started a little bit uh, yesterday about the uh, three modes of heat transfer, which is known as conduction, convection, and radiation heat transfer. Heat transfer is energy in transit due to a temperature difference, due to a temperature difference. Conduction occurs between the two surfaces, and if it's a surface, there's a two solid surface or a solid surface and a fluid, no problem. That will be fantastic, and it's going to follow the law of Fourier's law of transformation or Fourier's law of conduction, not transformation. Fourier's law, because we have a Fourier's law of transformation as well. Um, no, it's news. Okay, all right. So trying to ask me to update something, and I said to forget about updating at this point. They they they're finding a wrong time, wrong time to pop up on your screen some messages. Anyway, um, so the three modes of heat transfer. The first one is conduction, which is follows the Fourier's law when a temperature gradient exists in a stationary medium, which may be solid or liquid or fluid or liquid. So Q double prime X and sub X means we are uh, trying to figure out the amount of heat that is going to be transferred from the hot area or hot uh, region to a cold, cold region. So if we have a plain wall, and then this is the, uh, the, the temperature uh, uh, decrease from hot to cold area. So it goes through the wall of a, a length, some uh, known length. So Q double prime X means um, heat flux. Heat flux, it's per unit, it's a unit is watt. Okay, that's the unit of watt per meter square. So if it's a watt per meter square, that means uh, you're just trying quickly to figure out the uh, heat transfer uh, based on conduction heat transfer per unit area. That's what this form, that this notation stands for. And the temperature gradient, is dTdF. So this is the famous formula for conduction, uh, Q double prime X equals minus K, delta T uh, or dT over dx. dT can be written as T1 minus uh, T2, uh, or uh, how should I say T1 minus T2 divided by dx. dx could be the length, okay? You can replace it with length. So K is a thermal conductivity that is experimentally determined. You can just look that up in a table or it's given to you. 
So this is for one dimensional heat transfer by conduction, this picture here. So thermal conductivity is based on the wall materials, based on the material. So like if you, for example, in San Diego, we have uh, the walls, the outside walls, it's just a stucco. And then we have in between the walls, we have some uh, cushion, we call it the, uh, the, the R12, they call it R12. So those are the, um, uh, that will maybe the between the drywalls and there are some uh, materials that they insert when they do the construction to minimize the amount of heat transfer from inside the house to outside or the amount during the hot day. Uh, we have problem with the roof because the roof is a tile and like some other countries, they don't use that. They use maybe different materials because of the hot climate. In San Diego, during the summertime, if you have this, you know, uh, the ceiling that it's uh, covered by, you know, not the ceiling, the roof is covered by uh, certain tile, and those tiles is going to transfer heat to the uh, attics. Attics is if the attics, the, the amount of uh, R12 is is not placed in a you know in a thick you know in a uh, uh, enough or I I should say when because I in my house I go to the attics and check. I see that the, the materials are supposed to be in a high thickness. It's a very, because they, they didn't spend money on, or they just cut and paste the stuff, quick way of uh, building the homes, track homes. So they don't really pay attention of adding more material so that the heat will not transfer from the, you know, when the heat transfer to the attics and then from attics will transfer to your bedroom to your room, to your house, and then you have to spend more money on AC trying to cool that space that you have in the house. So this is the problem we have nowadays. And uh, I, uh, I'm going to ask someone to come and help me out so that we can add more materials because really the cost of electricity is going up and up. So we need to minimize the amount of uh, energy losses, okay, or, or energy coming into the house or energy leaving the house, okay, great. Uh, anyway, uh, so this is what we have in here in terms of conduction heat transfer, uh, some um, assumptions, a steady state conduction, uh, one dimensional con uh, condition through the wall, constant thermal conductivities, so that will be, yeah. and then the, if you wanna simplify that, and instead of using the minus sign here, and instead of saying T2 minus T1, so T2 minus T1, we just uh, change the, you know, we multiply by negative, so that negative is gonna go to positive, and then uh, T1, T1 that was supposed to be negative becomes positive, and T2 becomes negative. So we can write this uh, heat transfer flux by this formula here, which we call it K delta T over L. Okay, that's, uh, let's see an example, okay? Uh, example or, Okay, no problem. I'm going to just go here. Example. So we have the conduction rate equation, Fourier's law, the wall of an industrial furnace. Okay, this is very, very um, typical of conduction heat transfer because I used to work for DOE, Department of Energy. We used to go, uh, this was a funded project. I was a, uh, in charge of the Energy Institute at SPSU. So we, we were asked to go and visit some manufacturing companies around San Diego or about 50 miles radius of San Diego and within the San Diego County. And then we, we were supposed to audit or do the energy conservation opportunity survey for about 30 companies per year. That was, they gave us about $150,000 for 30 companies visit. That was, a, you know, and not myself, but other professor plus um, some graduate students who were working with us so we would go for eight hours of visit to that company. We have to make an appointment and all that. And free of charge to the company, this was an incentive by DOE, Department of Energy, so that they could just go and analyze their energy consumptions. So trying to let them know that if they cut down on their energy consumption, so the government then they don't have to build a power plant or, or the all kinds of you know, nuclear power plant and so on, so because it's dangerous. And we, were, we found out, you know, the okay, amount of bills, the utility bills that these companies were paying was about one and a half to $2 million a year. That's a waste money, wasted. 
on 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 uh, energy that you could conserve or uh, the topic was conservation of uh, energy opportunities um, I learned so much by visiting these companies which with the name of the companies we made it as unknown companies because we did not want the name of that company to be on the report we just call we use the code that was provided by DOE not Department of Defense is Department of Energy DOE their center was in Pennsylvania because I was responsible to submit or email or mail them the report I'm talking about 1992 to 1996 for four consecutive years I did the work with, for DOE to, through San Diego State University okay so anyway I learned unbelievable stuff that I didn't know about these things by taking, by being in education or taking courses, uh, because you learn more when you go to the site, to the manufacturing site, and to see what's going on. It's, it's unbelievable uh, stuff that was, was going on. They had a compressed air, and it leaks all over the place. There's amount of waste there. And then they had this oven, uh, 1600 degree Fahrenheit, we call it a clay oven or, or, or we call it a um, annealing oven, maybe that's a better word, annealing oven, for testing the material at a uh, high temperature, we call it the austenite temperature, and then taking those, those specimen or materials and then soaking it or uh, in an in a oil bath or in a water if they wanted to come up with the martensite ma microstructure that is the that means you have a very hard steel if you are dealing with a alloy steel 1018 1045 1060 or 1090 carbon steel so um, I found out that because we I teach materials class and I I, I really uh, pay attention to waste or what's going on uh, and uh, I know the behavior of the materials because that's engineering material science is going to teach you how the materials behave under different conditions. So the amount of heat that was transferring to, the, to that warehouse or that environment of that company that they housed their uh, ovens and then they had all kinds of other equipment plus uh, there's a hundreds of hundreds of lights that was on and the, um, and the, 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 the amount of heat that was transferred to the surrounding uh, via the cracks or the wall that was not well insulated um, and also the air conditioning was running that's the worst part do you have the this amount of heat is coming to the, to the area of the warehouse and you have this heat, uh, ac going so and if you run the the shift during the peak time then the the sdg and e or Sample energy, they will charge you double or triple for running your shift during the peak time. So this was the data that we collected and we wrote a report on that. We submitted to the company and we advised them to, to uh, you know, uh, implement this uh, uh, advice that we are giving them. And, if they, and then within uh, six months or seven months, if they do all these things, we are asking them you know, to replace or uh, maintain in, in a level that you minimize the amount of energy usage and the cost because if you hire someone with a sixty thousand dollars a year as a as a, um, um, a plant manager so this way you can just save million of dollars and if you replace your oven that is old with the brand new oven with a control temperature and all that you can just pay back will be uh it, it, within a three months or six months we have to give them some kind of calculations and show them uh, what will happen so and I wanted you to know that this is, uh, because I got to the fire clay, so we have a um, furnace, or, okay, furnace is constructed from a 0.15 meter thick fire clay brick, having a thermal conduct conductivity of 1.7 watts per meter Kelvin. Measurements made during a steady state operation reveal temperature of 1400 and 15 and 1150 Kelvin at the reveal on at the inner and outer surfaces respectively so this is the inner and this is the outer surface uh, uh, T1 at 1400 uh, Kelvin and T2 
it's going to be at a lower temperature because it's going through this uh, thickness, the wall thickness of 0.15 meters at x equals zero. The temperature T1 is at 1400 Kelvin. And as the heat flux goes through this wall, we, uh, we have a temperature that we measured. The temperature came out to be uh, 1150 Kelvin and the thermal conductivity is given as 1.7 watt per meter Kelvin. So, and then if you look at the wall and the, this um, uh, furnace, industrial furnace, I'm just looking at it from the uh, uh, solid model. Uh, we have a thickness here, we have the height, and we have the width, or we call this depth, okay, from solid model class. So heat flux, heat flux is K delta T over L, which is time, okay? K is a 1.7, and then delta T is T1 minus T2 over 0.15. So the, the heat flux, um, which is the watt per square meters, is 2,833. That's the amount of heat transfer and watt per meter square. But if we, the heat rate through the wall area, if I look at the area of this wall, which is the height times the width, and then if I multiply this 2,833 watt per square meter, I'm gonna end up with 1,700 watts. That's the amount of heat transfer, okay? All right, go ahead. I think that's the good example of conduction. Any question, guys? So this is really a straightforward, okay? A straightforward formula and compared to uh, all those formulas that we went over for energy balance and then mass flow rate and mass rate balance equation and uh, uh, entropy and rate of uh, entropy production and all that, we talked about that before. So this is fairly simpler than previous formulas, okay? All right, so. And uh, next, uh, we're gonna talk about convection heat transfer, another mode of uh, heat transfer, we call it a, uh, uh, based on Newton's law, uh, Newtonian convective cooling, I call it Newtonian convective cooling. So the Q, which is the heat transfer, is not per unit area, okay? It's just the H is a convective heat transfer coefficient. We have two types of uh, heat transfer coefficient due to Force convection, which is the blower. We have a blower that is blowing the air into the surface and uh, versus the natural convection, okay? Natural convection. So H is uh, experimentally determined or um, I, in a laboratory setting, I remember I, uh, I had a lab uh, called Newtonian convective cooling trying to estimate the heat transfer coefficient from a surface of uh, samples, uh, different material samples like uh, copper, like uh, aluminum, uh, and different geometric shape. And that age, because the, 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 the way we could determine the age was to embed uh, thermocouples uh, within that specimen. Uh, we drilled a hole in it and we solder it so that the thermocouple is made of two dissimilar materials that will be used to measure the temperature. Okay, which is a very sensitive, um, and it has a, it's connected to fluke, some type of device, we call it a fluke, and then you can measure the temperature drop when you uh, heat and those are specimens in a, in a 100 degree um, Celsius temperature, hot boiling temperature, and then you remove it, uh, to, uh, and you see that quickly is going to decrease the temperature. So we used to use the camcorder back in 1900, camcorder and trying to record uh, quickly on a, a dial indicator or the fluke uh, it will tell us that how every every 10 seconds we measure the temperature drop temperature drop, and then eventually we calculate the h value okay so i'm just trying to give you some background on how you can determine the heat transfer coefficient or convective heat transfer coefficient area this uh, s means surface surface temperature and Infinity, T infinity means um, environment temperature, okay? The atmosphere, uh, not atmospheric temperature, that the environment, okay? Environment, so the surrounding. Um, if the, the geometric shape, uh, to calculate the area, area that fluid uh, touches, okay? Area that fluid touches the surface, if it's a sphere, we have pi d squared, 
And if it's a wall, we have H times length. If it's a pipe, we have pi dl. So those are the area, and you can look that up, okay? And it's very easy to um, get a hold of all this formula, okay? All right, so, and so this is the beautiful formula. And tomorrow, I'm gonna go over sample problem for convective uh, convection heat transfer coefficient that takes place between a surface and the environment, okay, an environment. Uh, for example, if you have an industrial type of setting in a warehouse, and if you have a steam pipe is going across this warehouse and it's not well insulated, uh, there will be a high amount of energy heat transferred to the surrounding, which is a waste, okay? So uh, it is highly recommended on that kind of steam pipe that is going across this anger. We have an anger or, um, you know, that it, in an area that in a Coast Guard or some other places that I used to go and visit for, you know, some project I had back in the 1980s and 90s. And then uh, we needed to um, design a higher, uh, higher um, efficient compressor, air compressor, or, a, or we had to redo all the piping because it was the pipes were from uh, 60, 70 years ago. So we wanted to, re to redo all the piping for adding it uh, um, you know, and new equipment. So anyway, um, so I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to go over that. So the radiation heat transfer, uh, so we said that uh, the conduction, we call it the Fourier's law. Convection, we call it a Newton's law, right? Newton's law, uh, it's a convection. And then radiation, it's based on a Stefan Boltzmann law, okay? A Stefan, a Stefan Boltzmann law, and it gives you this formula. S uh, sigma, which is the constant, okay, sigma is a heat transfer constant, uh, area times T, surface temperature to the power of four. Remember that, this is the one thing you gotta remember that this, a temperature must be absolute for the radiation. For the convection and conduction, it doesn't matter whether you use the Celsius or Kelvin, but if you have a temperature in Celsius in radiation, heat transfer, you must convert the Celsius to Kelvin, okay, plus 273. So um, next is to uh, write uh, this uh, radiation heat transfer or Stefan Boltzmann law, uh, sigma times epsilon times area, the difference between surface temperature to the fourth power minus the temperature of surrounding to the fourth power, Emissivity, epsilon is known as emissivity. And then we're gonna talk about that for black body, we have uh, absorptivities, because if you have a black body, like a car that is, you know, uh, the, the color is black, during summer is gonna absorb more heat. That's why if you dress up with a, you know, with a uh, shirt that is black, you will get warmer or hotter during summer because the black body is going to absorb more energy. Uh, so we call it the absorptivities, okay, all right, so. Um, and then here, the control volume energy balance, we have the energy rate in minus energy rate out, and if the generation is not there, therefore, the negligible, and the storage um, energy uh, rate is, uh, for storage is negligible, so therefore, we have the rate of energy in equals out, so just, an, an, just a theory. And then Q is a heat rate, okay? Heat rate, we call it watt. If it's a Q to the uh, Q prime, we call it heat rate per unit length. And then the heat flux, we call it the watt or heat flux as a uh, unit on uh, a watt per meter square or square meter. Okay, and that is uh, um, what we have in here. Oh, I missed this one page here for convection. And uh, for convection, it transfer over the surface we have a t surface and we have a t infinity which is the environment and fluid flow is moving in this fashion here and then there is a heat transfer is leaving the surface and is touching this air that is moving fluid moving fluid okay that's a moving fluid so heat transfer that will occur between a surface and a moving fluid uh, between a surface and a moving uh, a fluid or a stationary fluid when they are at different temperature, because that temperature is different than the environment, so therefore the convection heat transfer will take place. 
we have a natural convection and we have a forced convection. Again, uh, in the future, if you are planning to maybe take more courses in heat transfer, you will, uh, they will elaborate more on this language of natural convection and a forced convection. Okay. So uh, Newton's law of cooling, um, so this is the beautiful formula. We already talked about that. And the heat flux is equal to proportional to the convection heat transfer coefficient. And T surface minus T infinity, the temperature difference. Again, this temperature difference, if it's in uh, Kelvin or Celsius, is not really a matter, but you need to really worry about the radiation and radiation, the temperature must be absolute. So the convective heat transfer flux and H is a convection heat transfer coefficient. All right, so I think I'm done for this part here. And then tomorrow I'm gonna go over some example problems of convection and uh, radiation heat transfer, okay? Convection and radiation heat transfer. And then we, I will tell you all about the uh, exams. Again, exam, final exam, and we're gonna start again on uh, Thursday midnight to Friday before 10 p.m. So uh, uh, you have plenty of time to take the exam and uh, maybe six problem, maybe eight problem. I haven't really designed the exam yet, but I have an idea of what to give you. Uh, similar procedure as the midterm exam one and two. So that will be the final exam. And, uh, and the goal is for you to enjoy this class and learn about the topic of thermal sciences. And um, you know, if you do your own work, you enjoy this concept. If someone else does the work for you, you just copy. And copying is not really cool. We call it in America, we say it's not cool, correct? Right? Cool, that means you want to acquire knowledge. Knowledge is power. If someone else does the work for you and you copy it, it's not really, it doesn't feel good. Uh, because uh, you know what I'm talking about. Please try to do your own work so that you can, uh, within your own system, you say that I really learned something. And professor was nice and explained everything within this uh, short period of time that we had. It was hard on you guys and hard on me. So I had, um, uh, I mean, last, last summer I taught properties of materials face to face. And some of you took the class with me. You know what I'm talking about, okay? And then the student did the project and they came and gave a presentation and a nice PowerPoint. And we had fun also, okay, in a three week session of last summer, 2019. And anyway, guys, um, I will uh, post the grades for you for chapter five uh, or homework number five and the midterm exam number two as soon as I am uh, as ready. And by the uh, end of today or sometimes tonight. And then I will sit down and design the exam, a final exam for you. Um, and then you can just work on it and send it back to me. Please do your work as clear, as clean as possible. And then if you are uh, copying from somewhere, uh, your letter is somewhere, it's just your, uh, you don't know what that is and you're just scribbling somehow. You're just doing something. I can tell, okay? I've been teaching for 100 years, and I know whether this work is kosher work, is good, is a work that you put effort, okay? And I can post the solution to the examiner. See, it takes more than two pages if you really show your work as neat as possible for each problem, at least uh, uh, two pages, or one page if you organize it nicely, you know, because I did this twice, I work on it twice to make sure that my second time it's organized and it's easy to follow. And when I see that uh, some students, they just don't write the formula, just plug the number into something in air, is a thin air. Just there's a, the formula even, you didn't bother to write the formula down. And then you plug the numbers, that has no values, no meanings. And you don't, you don't explain where you got the, and thermodynamics properties or values for H or 
enthalpy or entropy or internal energy from the table, you got to say at least you went to a steam table, you went to this table uh, right now. Because in our textbook, we have T, T1 table, T4, T3, and suddenly you put down A. A means uh, someone else textbook was at a table called A, so they copied down A. So that's how I know that someone else that had the book with the A, appendix A, they just copied that down. So I'm not trying to give you a hard time because I like you guys. I just wanted to give you a warning that I understand everything, okay? Uh, I used to teach remedial math, which is the hardest class to teach, dealing with people that they cannot add and subtract. So I grew old in the environment of education. So you may not be interested in what I'm saying, but one day, my friend, you will uh, think back and you say, Dr. Mo was really correct on what he was saying, all right? So, and I, I like you guys. I just want to ad give you advice because uh, the future is challenging sometimes because to come to it for the job, if you want to apply for a job, they ask you questions and if you don't know how to answer it, then they say, why you went to a school then for, correct? What was that for? Uh, anyway, so, uh, I'm not trying to give you a hard time, guys, okay? I'm just being friendly and giving you advice to make sure that um, you have this, you get the degree and you have acquired the knowledge needed to move forward in your life. Okay. I think I'm done. I'm done. And uh, you guys are great. And I'm going to stop the recording.